Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Lisa Kucher, the executive director of the Kremples Center. The Krempel Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of people living with brain injury from trauma, tumor, or stroke. In partnership with universities and community volunteers, the Krempel Center offers programs that engage its members in meaningful and productive experiences and provides ongoing support and resources to those, including survivors and family members, impacted by brain injury. In addition, the organization's community outreach initiative provides education to the public about brain injury and brain injury prevention. Lisa is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire, having double majored in social work and outdoor education. She served in a variety of leadership roles in a number of organizations leading up to her position as the executive director of the Krempel Center in 2009. In the full-length version of the interview, we discuss her early career as well as her time at the Krempel Center. The full-length interview runs about 90 minutes. I have produced an abridged version that runs about 40 minutes. This is the full-length version. If you'd like to listen to the abridged version, which begins with Lisa's time at the Krempel Center, please see our website, healthleaderforge.org, for the link. Also, if you do enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening, and here is Lisa Kucher. So welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be doing this with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing because you are a UNH grad, and that's always exciting that's right. to have on. <laughs> so you earned a Bachelor of Science in Social Work and a degree in Outdoor Education. Is that correct? That's right. At the University of New Hampshire. So what brought you to UNH, and how did you pick those two majors? It's kind of a long story, but we've got some time. We have some time. <laughs> so when I was in high school, I... Uh, got involved in this program called Upward Bound, oh, okay. and that's a, a basically a program to help kids who come from low-income families and whose parents didn't go to college, basically to help them to go to college. So I spent three summers, and um, also the program was during the academic year, but three summers on the UNH campus. So I lived on campus and took classes in build various buildings throughout the campus and it just became my home for six weeks for three summers and you know fell in love with it it's a beautiful campus and it became like kind of a second home for me so when it came time to applying to colleges UNH was definitely on my list and I was really excited to get in and um, get going at UNH way way back in 87. <laughs> okay. Was Upward Bound run out of the outdoor education? No. So it's, so people or? usually think about Outward Bound, which mm-hmm. when, you know, versus Upward Bound. So okay. Outward Bound okay. is that like adventure, uh, you right. know, you go and you do, you know, seven to 21 days in the wilderness or right. on a boat or what yeah. have you. So this is Upward Bound. It's a federally funded program. Um, I think it came, a, came about an anti-poverty um, programming back in the, you know, 60s. And they were looking to do a lot of anti-poverty work to improve people's, you know, quality of life, basically people who are on the edge of poverty and help lift them up out of that poverty. And so the Upward Bound program was is under this uh, group of programs called TRIO programs, and they're basically a variety of programs um, helping youth go on to further education. So I, I participated in that program, um, and they are throughout the country, and there's one at UNH. I believe there, there still is even now. I believe there might be one out of Keene State as well. I'm not sure if that's still active. And there's, you know, one or two in, I think, most states in the country. Neat. Yeah, it's a great program. So you draw, You already had a relationship with UNH. And, yeah. And it sounds like you're working with um, you know, disadvantaged populations. So that sounds very social work. I know. So I was like in a program. <laughs> and, you know, I also – so what really got me into social work was um, I actually started off um, in environmental studies okay. at UNH. I was very much – a outdoors person and also a a person who really cared about sort of doing right in the world. And so protecting the environment made a lot of sense to me when I first started college. Uh, But what happened was I didn't do terribly well my first semester. So I left school unhappily and took a semester off and worked 
and I took a job working in a group home with people with developmental disabilities, had a friend who was doing that. So I got in on that job and it turned out to be really the, the door opening to social work and recognizing that I really wanted to support and help people who needed, who needed help and engaging and being a part of our community. So I, I enjoyed that work very much. And it got me thinking about, you know, was environmental studies the right fit for me? And it really turned out to be not the right fit for a variety of reasons, but social work, social work did feel right. So when I went back to school that fall uh, and, and re-enrolled, I started off in social, went, ba- went back and changed my major social work. I'm not really exactly sure of the timing of when I added outdoor education, but I would say a year, within a year or so, I added uh, outdoor education as a second major. And that just came about because of my experiences with Upward Bound, where there was some adventure programming with that, combined with, you know, my love of the outdoors. Outdoor ed made a lot of sense to me because it was really about people's personal growth through outdoor adventures in a variety of ways. And it, it was a fit, A, because of my love of the outdoors, but also B, when I was in high school, I actually did do an Outward Bound one summer, I actually left the Upward Bound program to go do an Outward Bound in Colorado um, and hiked the Rocky Mountains for, I think it was a 14-day trip and, you know, decided that the person who was leading that, boy, I'd really like to be doing that. That seemed pretty awesome. And because the experience was so uh, impactful for me in terms of, mm, my own personal development and development of like, I guess, confidence and leadership skills that meant a lot to me. Yeah. So that's how I ended up with those two majors. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you graduated with those majors. Uh, what did you do after graduation? What was kind of that? Where, where did they lead you? Yeah. So, well, what's great about both of those programs is, they, programs is that they require internships. And so I first did my social work internship I helped create or develop the um, Seacoast Outright, which is a program for basically, I think that there was no minimum age, but kids up to 21 who were identifying as uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, questioning. It started up back, back then. It's still running to this day. And it was out of Portsmouth. And I just helped some people who were getting that going. So I facilitated the very first meeting with kids that showed up. It was really powerful and cool work. So that experience helped, you know, me recognize more. I had a lot of experiences in, in, you know, employment or internships that helped me understand a, a, what I really enjoyed doing, but also b what I really didn't enjoy doing. So that helped me understand how much I enjoyed working with young people, people who were motivated, excited, excited about what we were offering them. The, I also interned in outdoor education with WIDS Women out in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is, um, was, it's no longer, basically a program getting women out adventuring in the outdoors. So I spent a, like a summer and fall with them, leading trips with women, women and kids, everything from rock climbing to canoeing. There's the Boundary Waters up there, so that was pretty awesome. And also with women in prison, which was really different, unique. Felt like I was, you know, utilizing my social work skills, building all kinds of great skills. And again, that leadership and confidence building was happening through that experience. So so when I finished with, and that, that internship was kind of the, happened right after graduation, I did that internship. Um, and then I, my first paid job, non-internship after that was uh, working for Spur Rink School, which is, is, was, I don't really know where they're at right now, but a, a residential and school program for kids who basically aren't living, can't live at home for a variety of reasons. Either they're, you know, either the family is really messed up and or they are, or a combination usually okay. of that. So what would they would say that at-risk mm-hmm. kids I did that work for about, I think, about six or seven months, and it was a pretty horrible <laughs> experience. Oh, really? Yeah, it wasn't oh. a good fit. So I okay. think, you know, one of my biggest takeaways for the listener is yeah. going to be really about taking risks, trying things, exploring what you think that you might be interested in doing, 
And, and then you can check that box, whether it's like, yeah, that's going to help me move in the direction I thought I was, or that's going to turn my direction. But it all is a building block to recognizing who you are, the kind of work that you're good at, yeah. and the kind of work you enjoy doing. Oh. So I realized, nope, that I am <laughs> way too uh, hard on the sleeve for this really rough bunch of kids. Yeah. And so, so that was yeah. probably one of my first experiences, too, recognizing it's not only about the work I'm doing, but about the work culture yeah. and recognizing that positive growth, you know, professional growth developing environment is really essential for me that I don't function well in dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people can. I yeah. mean, you know, I know plenty of people who do, yeah. who really can make it work in tough environments because they've got other things that really work for them. And they aren't um, maybe as thin-skinned as I am in terms of my sensitivity to what's happening in my surroundings. Yeah. So learning a little bit about fit and mm -hmm. kind of finding that way. So so that that you learned what didn't fit, and so you moved on and did yeah. what, what kind of... So from there, and that's you know, going way back, it's a little hard to yeah. remember the details. But I think, oh, I that was when I actually... Um, landed, ran, I did a little retail work for a little while, just like, what am I doing? And trying yeah. to figure out what was next. And landed an unexpected job working with a young boy with autism um, in a home program. So I worked one-on-one -on -one with him. Um, he wasn't he wasn't able to make it in the regular classroom. He was six six years old at the time. And so I worked one-on-one -on -one with him um, and a team to basically teach him. It was very particular methodology, um, applied behavior analysis. So I was doing that work. Uh, for a couple of years, and then I went to grad school. Okay. But in there, I met one um, someone who turned out to be a mentor for me, which is the mom of that boy, mm -hmm. um, and her name is Barbara Frankel. And she actually has gone on to develop two nonprofit organizations, one being Birch Tree Center, which is up and running in, you know, in Portsmouth, and that's a school. it's basically a school for kids with autism. And then she's right now has been building another organization called Green Guard. And I think that's the first time I have really had close experience with someone who was a visionary and who founded something out of this passion and vision and really had the capacity to make that happen and mm -hmm. figured out how to make that happen. And find that very, that I would say, I, you know, I, I would say I'm not a founder type, but I've, have definitely worked with those those who are, and I find them very, you know, admirable. Yeah, and they're always something to learn. What's from them. what what makes a founder type? Since you've had a chance um, to see a few, I think so much. You know, it's really about being an entrepreneur. So it's really about having an idea, and taking that idea to the nth. Um, and so that requires you know a particular mind and a depth of passion that is like deeper than, you know, deeper than anything. And uh, any founder I've met, they're really quite sharp people. And they figure out in how, whatever way it takes, they figure out what resources they need mm -hmm. to make something happen. Mm -hmm. And they are steadfast and they work themselves to the bone. <laughs> All right. That's my ex that's my experience of, <laughs> of founders. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a completely healthy work life balance. But, but yes, I mean, I'm too lazy to be a founder. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't, yeah, obviously I'm not either. But um, well, interesting. Okay, so you, so you work with with was her name was Frankel. Yeah, Barbara Frankel. Barbara yeah. Frankel for and, and her son for a number of years. I worked with, yeah I worked with him directly for a couple of years, and she you know she was the mom, and she obviously oversaw it was a home based program. So mm -hmm. and then I went to grad school. Okay. Then I went to then I you know I kind of knew I had a sense of what I wanted, and that was I had a good sense that a master's degree was going to help me get what I wanted. And, and I what thought was your it, sense that you wanted it? I think I wanted to run an organization. Okay. You know I would think I was pretty clear that um, you know that. I wanted to do more than direct service um, and wanted to, I, I felt like I had the capacity to manage something. So so what does the phrase direct service mean? Well, in, in social services or social work, it's really just, you know, working with a population directly and providing that service to them. Okay. As opposed to running the organization. 
organization that right. provides the direct services. Right, services. exactly. Okay. Got it. And that's not to say you don't have contact. It's just different. It's not the, it's not the, it's, you might have interaction, but it's not providing the service. So why a, why a master's in social work, which is what you went, earned at University of New England? Right, versus like an MBA or something, exactly, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. That's my question. So, you, you know, know you want to run stuff. Why not right, do? right. Yeah. No, I'm I just too, too, um, doing good on behalf of people, whether it's justice related or advocacy or making people's lives better. That's just who, I, who you know, it's just part of my temperament. Okay. It really always has been. I remember this time when I was, uh, so it was probably like second grade or something. And I was taking swimming lessons and the big kids, like sixth graders, were at the back of the bus and I wanted to sit at the back of the bus. And they were mean. And so I would sit back there and then they would like be mean, kind of bully me. And I'd come home crying to my mom and she'd be like, well, just don't sit at the back of the bus. And I just knew that that was wrong. And that there was something to fight for there. So I think just that sense of justice, like wanting to do what's right and that, you know, belief that people were equal and should be treated well. And um, I wanted to do my part to Hmm. make that happen. Okay. Yeah. So how did the master's program prepare you for the next stage of your career? I I think I'm a very much a hands-on person. Like I think the classes were... Fantastic. I think, you know, they were very progressive. The department was very progressive. The program was progressive. But it was really about the experiences, the internships. So I had a couple of internships. I interned at Woodman Park Elementary School in Dover and thinking to myself, maybe I'll be a school social worker Mm. and discovered that I really wasn't meant to work in an institution. Like it just wasn't the right work culture for me. I enjoyed kids, but was really realizing, eh, I'm not sure little kids is kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so again, it was more of those learning what I don't want. And then the following year, I did an internship with Family Strength, and that was a really a, a program supporting families who were at risk of losing their kids, who were sort of, again, more on the edge, poverty edge. Mm-hmm. And I did a few different things with that organization. But one of the things I did was a little bit of grant writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I also did some direct service work. I uh, worked with some pretty pretty tough clients, um, but some pretty interesting ones as well. But affirming that I didn't want to get a clinical degree. And so in social master's of social work, you can go two routes. And one is like a clinical where you end up basically being a therapist. And then the other is what they would consider like macro, macro or community. And it just affirmed I really wanted to do something more, what was a community level or macro level, and that could, can include being a leader and running an organization. So mm-hmm. just clarified to me, a little, a little bit of grant writing I did, you know, I could envision doing some of that kind of work. That's very, very typical for an executive director to be doing mm-hmm. grant writing, what have you. So just getting my feet wet a little bit mm. with that. Um, and there were definitely some leadership, uh, there was a leadership course I took. We did a lot of temperament um, scales and that kind of thing to kind of get to know yourself and what kind of leader you are. That was good, a good thing too. And I very much an advocate for that and thinking about leadership. We were just really... doing the Myers Briggs in my class okay. yesterday. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What are your letters? My letters are uh, E N F P. Me too. Is that right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we can be friends now. We can be friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I, I like doing those with, uh, when I teach my org behavior class, we do a bunch of that kind of stuff. And I think it's great for starting a conversation about who you are and, and trying to understand who you are. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that actually really speaks to our temperament too. Yeah. Like ENFPs are very curious about people. Right. And, right? right. So of yeah. course we're like, temperament, <laughs> temperament scales, get to know yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you graduated. Did you go directly to uh, HHS or was something in between? I actually, I actually, um, right after school, I started working with Barbara Frankel in a different role, oh, and that okay. was to help her develop Birch Tree Center. Okay. And so, so I did a ton of grant writing, ton of grant writing for her. 
um, and helping to create a, a nonprofit. So, you know, all the, what's all involved in that conversations with the state because we're going to be creating this program that's a school program. And so what, what are the requirements around that? Um, had a great experience communicating with another organization and asking them, hey, basically, can you share with me yeah, policies and procedures? And they just did a ton of sharing. It was a good experience for me in the, this is what, how nonprofits should work together. Is that like, hey, I've got some expertise. You've got some expertise. We're all looking to make the th same thing happen. So let's work together and do that. So I like to be able to get, do that for others. And I continue to ask and ask and ask for help. Like, please help me with <laughs> this. Just got an email from a colleague today. So what are your, what are your you know, pay ranges for these kind of positions? I really think it makes a huge difference in our work if we can lean in on each other and <laughs> Um, help each other out to figure out how to navigate be better nonprofits, um, better leaders, help us meet our missions kind of thing. Do you find that that is the, in fact the case that, that there's a community sense yeah. among nonprofits? Yeah, I think you, just, you have to, I mean, yeah, I do actually. But, and I think it's easier when you find your peeps and you make those, build those connections yeah. and wherever you find them. And I look for them everywhere, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anywhere I can find them. Yeah, yeah. But having, for me, having a handful of executive director peers to reach out to and bounce stuff off is huge. Yeah. Yeah. So you worked with Birch I worked with, Birch yeah, Birch I worked with Barbara, helped oh. to develop that. Okay. So that got off the ground. And then I went and, yes, then I went and worked for the state. Okay. Um, it actually wasn't very long stint. It overlapped yeah. a couple of years, but it was just really literally like a seven month, oh. um, experience, um, within homeless and housing services. Mm. That was a really educational experience for me. Um, it's different than what you'd been doing in the past. It's yeah. Like with kids, it was a, right. It was education. A, definitely a different, uh, turning a different corner for mm -hmm. me. Not far from a passion of mine, which is really about, I really do care about po issues of poverty. So it felt a good, like a good fit in that way. It was interesting to be on the other side of funding in terms of making decisions about funding and, you know, frankly, holding, holding accountability around the, the organizations that were funded, holding them accountable for what they need to be held accountable for. Frankly, it kind of sucked. <laughs> <laughs> How so? Because like, I think my my spidey sense was that I was just a pain in their butt. You know, like, oh, God, they're calling. They need this from us or whatever. It was like, we're on the ground. We're doing the work. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Mm -hmm. It's really true. Just, just, you know, being a bureaucrat, I think, is not any fun. Yeah. Um. It was again it was it was educational um but it wasn't a good fit for me it was yeah. boring frankly it was yeah. a bit boring. i say that with the fact my brother works for the department of health uh, department of um environmental services he's a he's a he's a bureaucrat but he loves it and he does a great job with it yeah also you know it really depends on probably on your department and that kind of thing mm -hmm. but just for me and my temperament it wasn't the right fit you yeah. know yeah. sitting at a desk pushing paper around yeah <laughs> an important paper right because that, that's yeah. uh, like you said so these are people who you'd be reaching out to to get um funds maybe asking for grant do they give grants so How? basically i would be on the receiving end mm -hmm. of grant proposals yeah so and, we're reviewing them yeah reviewing grants um overseeing the funds basically yeah. the distribution of the funds yeah. it is really important work it just yeah. wasn't right just for me to be doing it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you weren't there all that long and um, you moved to Fairtide to yes. be the executive director. And you were actually the first executive director. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what Fairtide was, is, yeah. still is? Still is. Still is. Yeah. I was just looking at their website. So still yeah. is. So what was Fairtide? Uh, transitional housing program okay. for families who were at risk or were homeless. Very small program, totally grassroots developed, like, Basically, the story was that the woman who really found spearheaded it had a young person living with her that was homeless. 
And she thought to herself, why is there something out there for this kid? And she just started working with the state, having conversations, found a house, you know, bought a house with basically, I think it's really a group of friends from church and with some funding from the state and created this transitional housing program is really what that means is um, people are living in this home, this apartment building. It's their, their rent is subsidized and they're getting support services. So my job as executive director was overseeing the organization and providing the services, which I actually really enjoyed. Very, a very good, interesting experience for me. Um, I was the only employee until actually not too long after I started, there had been this woman who had said, hey, why don't we create a, why don't we um, have a thrift store associated with this organization that would help bring money into the organization? Mm -hmm. um, another one of those, you know, creative founder types. And that worked out superbly. And I still have that thrift store. And it is a source of funding for the transitional housing program. So that's pretty awesome. So I had my job and then I oversaw the, the thrift store manager. How many people were you providing housing to at any given time? Were they families? Were they Yeah. So there were five apartments. Okay. One was basically a single unit, like a studio. And the other were two or three bedrooms. And so the others were almost always occupied by a family, usually a single mom with one or two kids. And transitional. So they were expected to only be there for a little while? Two years. Two they years had up to two years. Okay. And we would basically develop goals and work towards those goals for them to be successful and then move on. Mm -hmm. And then they would, the reality is in two years, you know, you're not going to leave and then be able to afford your own place, but they were all leaving with subsidized housing to live section elsewhere. Section 8 kind of? Yeah, thing. Section 8 mm -hmm. voucher. Voucher. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so my, yeah, so my job was basically to support them working on their goals, usually working with like the local mental health center because often there was mental health needs there. Um, it's pouring them whether it was, you know, getting child care or, you know, what were the barriers basically to them being able to support their family and helping okay. them work toward that. And the reality is, um, you know, folks who are coming into that situation, their lives are very complicated, very complex. Um, I learned a lot about that in the sense of understanding that usually they were coming from living in poverty growing up. More often than not, they had one or two other things going on. They had a learning disability. Maybe they had a developmental disability. Maybe they had mental health issues and complicated by the fact that they also had one or two or more kids. Mm -hmm. So making it even more difficult for them to sort of rise up, you know, yeah. um, support themselves and their family. So, yeah. but you, I could also see progress that was being made. So it was very rewarding work. Did you have a team of volunteers supporting you as well? Or was it just basically you and the, the thrift shop manager? Yeah. So there were definitely volunteers to help with a variety of things from babysitting when we could have meetings with the, uh, with the residents to volunteering at the thrift store to volunteers who were on the board of directors. Yeah. I would say the most challenging thing was the board going from, so me being the first executive director, the board had really been hands-on with the organization, even like selecting the people living there. Um, and so then for them to need, they needed to step back and then let me do that work. And their job then was to do other things, was to, um, you know, to ensure that we were working towards our bigger goals, to fundraise, um, normal governance work. And that was a very painful transition mm. because... <laughs> the other interesting thing I found, I've discovered about founders is they don't really care about rules. It's like <laughs> their rules are the rules. Uh -huh. And when you say words like best practice or they're like, that means nothing to me. And I really think it has to do with how their minds work and how mm. they see the world. And it's like, no, you get done when you need to get done. And, and uh, you know... When, when you're an entrepreneur entrepreneur type, you're making the rules, right? But in the nonprofit world, that's not really how it works. There is an expectation that the organization matures and develops. And part of that development is, is founders and founding 
members, like founding board members or what have you, need to step back mm-hmm. from and shift the work that they're doing. Yeah. So that was the most challenging part of the job, really. So that's fascinating because so you were at a at a kind of a turning point in that organization where they were having to make that. They were big enough that they yeah. were able to hire an executive director right. and and needed an executive director, right. I assume. And yet they were kind of going through the process of figuring out what that next stage looked like. Right. Yeah, and not really uh, – and, you know, I was much younger than I am now. I'm still learning, I think, how to best help people learn that. I think – I honestly, you know, having – been through this kind of work for a long time now. I think sometimes it's just actually going through bumpy times that there is no way to really do it except in a very bumpy manner. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's the work. So that was a. I mean, that's a fascinating, a uh, fascinating time to be entering into an organization and kind of trying to professionalize it. Yes. Right. Yeah. Best practices and maybe having actual accounting practices and right. things like that. Right. That. Probably could have just been loose and right, yeah. Uh, prior, I think it's all very normal, right. you know, to for things to be kind of loose and you know, etc. Mm-hmm. And then it is part of the maturing process, but you know, growing pains are growing pains, right? They're still pain, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were with uh, Fair Tide for about four years, right? And um, uh, you left Fair Tide. And went to Rockingham Community Action as a outreach program director. Um, what is uh, Rockingham Community Action, and, and what did you do as a pro- uh, outreach program director? For that? So I, um, I, I really enjoyed my time. Really loved the mission of Fair Tide, mm-hmm. and enjoyed my years there. But was ready to shift out of being executive director for a while because it was pretty challenging. Those parts I was just describing were challenging. And so I wanted to continue to do work that I felt passionate about, but not be a, an executive director. So I moved into community, a community action agency. Rockingham Community Action is actually right now, it's, it's actually a part of Southern New Hampshire Services, which is another community action agency. But at the time, it was an independent community action. And community action organizations come from the early 60s um, war on poverty funding to basically safety net funding. So you go to a community action agency for um, uh, WIC, you know, women and children, oh. for with subsidy, you know, basically mm-hmm. to help, help you know, young families um, with food and other needs for Head Start. So early, an early education program, again, for low-income families fuel assistance. So you can think about these little really old like safety net programs fall under a community action agency. So they get a basically like a license from or they're appointed they're, by the government a government agency to take the funds and do that? Right. So they're all over the country and okay. some states have like one community action, some states have multiple community actions. But mm-hmm. all states have community actions because the federal government sends them money mm-hmm. to run these particular programs. Mm. So nobody else can do it. It's it, they kind of That's have a right. monopoly to, on the. I think community action. The, there are some that just community action does, and community action. I think is depending on the community action, they may have something underneath them. Like some may have like a Meals on Wheels underneath community action, mm-hmm. and otherwise, a Meals on Wheels could actually be independent of community action. So I think there are some that always fall under community action, and then some that community actions absorb in. Or can absorb so the community action program. organization can do more than those kind of specific government programs that must be done by a community action. Right, right. But there are programs that must be done by a community action yes. organization yep. in any given state. Right. Interesting. Or okay. they're probably likely to be, know you know, when the funding comes around, there may be other agencies that are saying, we'd like that funding. Ah. So there might be some competition. Okay. I don't know quite enough about how that works, but I think for the most part, they are generally falling under the community action agency. Okay. So when I was at Rock Campaign Action, I oversaw the outreach centers. So there, the main office was in Portsmouth, but they had two outreach centers, one in Raymond, oh, three, one in Raymond, one in Derry, and one in Seabrook, because Rock Campaign Action covered the whole of Rockingham County. And so at those centers, people would come in and seek the services that Community Action offers and also have access to like food pantry 
And there may be other services that that particular center supported, like maybe, you know, holiday gifts, that kind of thing. Mm. So I oversaw the staff of those programs and the funding for those programs. And there was also a separate program that I oversaw, which was um, basically a homeless outreach program. So a couple of staff that would literally go out to the woods and converse with people who were living on the streets or in the woods well, kind well, of thing. Yeah. Um, and just yeah, be New Hampshire, so they could be living in the woods. Right. Yeah, yes. literally, yeah. yeah. And so there, you know, throughout the state, there are these people that continue to do that work, that go out and touch base and bring them socks or, you know, things they need. Because they may either A, choose not to be in the homeless shelter or B, have been kicked out of the shelter because they're, you know, actively using drugs or what have you. Right. So, um, so over, oversaw that and did that for a, a couple of years and actually really, really enjoyed that work. Because again, yeah. it was really, you know, supporting pe- people regarding poverty issues, safety net programming. It's essential. So you did that for a couple of years. And so in 2009, you joined the Crumple Center where right. you are today. I know. Can you believe that? <laughs> I was hopping on around a lot until then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you've been here, uh, you've been here as the executive, you came in as the executive yes. director? Yeah. So you've been the executive director for 10 years plus now. Right. So before we talk about your role, let's talk about the Crumple Center. What is the Crumple Center? How did it come about? And, and what does it do for, for its clients? So we are a community program for adults living with acquired brain injury. And what that means is someone who was living without a disability and then suddenly had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or another injury to the brain, such as like a brain tumor or maybe loss of oxygen to the brain or what have you, that impacted them long term. And we serve people from age 18 through, you know, into their senior years. And uh, about half the people that come to our program have had a traumatic brain injury. So like a car accident or a fall. And about a quarter have had a stroke. And then a quarter kind of fall in the other, the other, other category. And after people go home when they're, after they've gotten sort of back on their feet, maybe literally, maybe not, have the basic, can do some basic things, getting around the house, being mobile, feeding themselves, hopefully talking again. But they're recognizing that they're not able to go back to work. They're often very socially isolated. Um, and they're struggling with both visible and invisible aspects of their injury, which can be very stressful and confusing both for them and the people in their lives. And so this leads to a lot of depression, despair, a lack of sense of how to navigate this new life. Now, some people have uh, injury to their brain and they can go back to that life. It's mild enough that they're able to go back to work, what have you. But if you're not, um, you don't have much going on in your life outside of perhaps outpatient rehab. And that's not much of a life, especially if you're a young person or a middle-aged person, frankly, or Even when you're a senior, it's tough. But at least at that point, you may be retired or what have you. It's not so life as life throwing up in the air as if you were, let's say, 40 and had a stroke. So people are struggling and at home and not doing well. And before this organization was founded, that was their life. David Crumples, who the organization is named after, had a traumatic brain injury. And his story is very much like I just described. Uh, But what was different for him is that he was awarded a significant amount of money from his accident. And he spent, after kind of settling into sort of living with his injury and getting back on his feet financially, he wanted to do something good with the funds he had received. And so he started actually with some friends providing brain injury survivors with some like emergency funding because he had struggled financially. He knows what that, he knew what that was like. Um, But as he was having these conversations with people over a couple of years, he was really hearing people say what, what this person really needs is a friend. And so he recognized that himself because of his own isolation, his own struggles. And so he started to conceptualize this idea of a place for people to come together to connect with those who understand what they're going through, to work on skill building and exploring new life interests and really finding a new path in this on their their life trajectory. 
And so that program opened up here at the community campus in Portsmouth in 2000, um, which was, gosh, 19, 19 years ago this October, actually. Mm-hmm. And, you know, start off with just a handful of brain injury survivors. We partnered with UNH right away, uh, their occupational therapy program. And so we had brain injury survivors and a few occupational therapy programs and a couple of staff. Um, and it's grown, you know, by leaps and bounds over all these years. We've had, you know, hundreds of people with brain injury coming into our program and then, you know, moving on. Mm -hmm. Or we have some people that still 19 years later coming to our program Mm because we say once a member, always a member, because we know that so many people are living with the chronic effects. And if they need to step away for a while, but then find they want to come back, they can. So the door is always open. Um, And we've had, you know, probably at this point, maybe thousands of UNH interns, not just occupational therapy, but um, uh, therapeutic recreation speech and language, social work, psychology. I just met a couple of psychology students yesterday, actually, that were starting their program. Uh, a lot of undergrad, but also some graduate students as well. And mostly from UNH, but some from other schools mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. It's really a really strong program and um, really making a difference in people's lives. And, you know, have been able to conduct research with, U- with UNH, actually, which has been great. That really shows the results of what we're doing, the impact it has on people's quality of life. Are there a lot of programs like Crumple Center out uh, across the U.S.? Or? There really aren't, actually. There's not much at all. There's probably a handful throughout the country, and that was true when it first started, and it's still true now. There are some programs called what's called the Clubhouse Model. Um, that The Clubhouse Model was started for people who are living with mental illness and helping those folks primarily with building employment skills. And so they actually took that model and transitioned it to uh, people with brain injury as well. And there are a bunch of those out there, primarily in a few states where there's funding associated with that. That's a a different model. It's very specific in its focus, and it's a very specific way of working with brain injury survivors. Ours is different and unique, and it it still is. It's really um, viewed very positively in the brain injury community not only in the state, but regionally, but it's, you know, really a matter of funding. I think there should be more out there. I'd love to see that. And I think it's, I hope it's only a matter of time that there's a uh, more funding available for programs like this. Yeah. So you, you have programming three days a week, is that right. correct? Yep. So what does that look like? So interestingly, it's very, the foundation of what we do every day is very similar to what we did way back. So the bones of it are still similar. So it's structured that, you know, we have something called early bird groups. It's really a group-based model. So what we're offering throughout their day are opportunities to participate in group programming. What's great about what we do is that we are not offering one class at a time, but we're offering, you know, three to five classes at a time. So people have lots of choice. Uh, The other great thing about our model is that people can participate as frequently or infrequently or for an hour on a day or for the whole day. So it starts off with what we call early bird groups. Those are more informal, anything from cards and coffee to computer tech to we usually have a, like a, like a volleyball game going on early. Um, Then we have what's called community meeting. And that's when, if you're here for the day, you're probably going to be there for a community meeting. It's when we connect as a big group. People have a chance to kind of chat with their friends, hear about the program day, and understand what their options are, and just kind of catch up with each other, catch up as a community. It's really, uh, you know, well, you've been. I think it's fairly yep. uh, energetic, mm-hmm. and people feel pretty psyched to be there and connect with each other. And then we have a morning group or class or classes And again, people have like, you know, usually four or five choices to pick from. Anything from like a physical activity to what's considered like a functional skill, like a cooking class, to maybe something that's like creative arts, to we often are offering something that's more like cognitive or brain education oriented. And I feel like there's like another category I'm missing in there. Uh, Yes, more like psychosocial support. So some kind of like mental health oriented class. 
And so we'll offer that in the morning and then it's lunchtime and we are lucky enough to be at the community campus, which means we're a part of a micro community of nine other nonprofits and there's a big cafe. So often many of our community members are having lunch in the cafe. Um, we have our interns there. So there's usually about 60 or 70 people here. I fill in the cafeteria, maybe into some overflow space for the lunch hour. And then we have a one o'clock group, again, similar types of them I mentioned for the morning, but di- but different op- options. And then two days a week, we have what's called the uh, art studio, which is really a space for people who want to be working on their art to come together. It's not like a formal educational, it's more just like, you know, supportive environment for mm-hmm. working on art and materials available, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the day. And yeah. it's, you know, three days a week. And there's no, there. while categorically you're going to see some overlap, like you might have a mental health group a couple different days, the topic's going to be different, the focus is going to be different. Um, or let's say you have pickleball on Monday, and then Wednesday you might uh, be doing basketball or what have you. So again, categorically, we're going to be, you know, having similar you know, I guess you could call them kind of domains that we're focusing on, but it all rotates. And then we change up that schedule. We have a fall semester of like a schedule that's the same, you know, and then a spring semester looks a little different than that. And in the winter and summer, we have a little different programming because we have less interns. So we have um, more people from the community coming in and sharing their skills and expertise. So everything from, you know, making jam to doing theater to maybe some performances or doing some history or what have you, just um, coming in, sharing, or maybe actually we had someone doing, um, it wasn't Taekwondo, but it was something like that mm-hmm. this this summer, um, Northeast Passage we have come usually doing yeah. some programming with us. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of shakes things up. So there's not, the great part about our program, I think, um <laughs> One of the great parts is that there's nothing um, there's nothing dull about it. I always have new people coming in, whether mm-hmm. it's students or whether it's community members, and it gives our members a chance for a lot of socialization, a lot of opportunity for communication, um, a lot of opportunity to share your story, that kind of thing, which is all good for reintegrating back in the community. Yeah. So you work with in particular, occupational therapy and therapeutic recreation, those programs from, from your work. And speech and language. Oh, yep. speech and language. Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've talked about a bunch of different kind of programming that you do. How much are, are those people, how, how much are the how much are the UNH staff involved in and faculty involved in helping you design appropriate programming and uh, how much is that as your... Yeah. Your staff? I mean, is it a collaboration? What does that look like? So I would say, well, first of all, we always get feedback from our members and they tell us like what's programming they really enjoy with the work, you know, what, what they'd like to see more of. Um, uh, we have an expectation of our, so our students are facilitating the groups. We provide supervision in the morning and in the afternoon. They have to put together a planner for their groups, and on their planners, they have to uh, provide information about how this is evidence-based in terms of the therapeutic benefits of what they're going to be doing with our members. So it's, I would say, rigorous in that way in terms of it's not activities, you know, it's actually therapeutic programming. Um, We have two licensed occupational therapists on staff. We have a licensed social worker. Um, We have another MSW on staff. So we bring that professional expertise okay. um, with varying years of experience working with people with brain injuries specifically. And then we always are collaborating with our UNH, you know, whoever our yeah. kind of point people are in the okay. department. Mm-hmm. Um, and we usually are meeting with them and talking with them throughout the semester. We actually have one therapeutic rec staff member here um, supporting the TR students once a week for the supervisory piece that they're required. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we are providing, you know, we're, we're providing the, the supervision. So I would say it kind of varies by department in terms of how the communication. And then you have, like, we also have social work students in psych, psychology students, but the their, their experience is a little different, so we might have a different working relationship with them. Okay. Again, just varies department by department. 
So you have interns here and you're requiring uh, for them to show you the evidence-based therapeutic uh, value. Can you give me an example of an activity and then kind of explain what the therapeutic value, what we're talking, when, when we say therapeutic value, what, what does that look like when you're working with uh, brain injury? Mm. What kind of therapeutic mm-hmm. value are we talking about? So maybe it's about supporting our members to come up with coping mechanisms for areas of deficit, for example. Maybe it's coming up with adaptive uh, ways to adapt to be able to participate in an activity. And so it's about deeper participation. It's about skill, you know, skill building, for example. So, or to say, we're going to focus on, for example, helping people understand about a certain part of their brain and how that works. And then if you have an injury to that brain, how, what, you know, what, what that, what that mean can mean for a person and then talking about how educating people about their injury has therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. So those would be, I think a few different ways that someone might be able to show that. Okay. Um, it, maybe they have some literature to sort of back, back it up or what have you. So, so so can you give me an activity that would do one of those things? And then how does that actually, so like, is it? So it could be, uh, yeah, it could be, it could be something like, I was thinking more about, you know, some like a physical activity group, um, how to help people participate or like a cooking group or like a, you know, um, sort of an education group. So it it kind of completely varies. On more of the creative arts end, I mean, I think there's tons of literature out there and I think students would have a very hard time at all finding sort of this therapy, the therapeutic benefits of art. I think especially when you bring in not only like the, so, and there's all kinds of benefits, right? So there's the psychological healing benefit of art. There's the actual being able to participate in doing art with adaptations. There's also like the sequencing piece, you know, like, okay, you want to take an, an art, a project from point A to point Z, think about the cognitive skills it takes to go through that process, the transitions to the next steps or what have you. So there's all of that just from doing a piece of art or craft. And then if there's some other, the, what, what I love to see is when that's a creative arts experience is layered with telling your story, your brain injury story, or telling some part of your brain injury story. So for example, we, we did this photo program where people were sharing a story through a photo about, about their injury. So you can, you can see all of those pieces come into play in terms of planning and doing art, for example. But then there's also this healing that takes place through the sharing of your story and educating other people. So those, I mean, you can just see the impact that has on people. Yeah. Yeah. So how many members do you have at any given time? Active members. I guess you probably yeah. have, Pat, you have members who are maybe not coming. Right, right. So like on any given day, you said maybe 60 or 70 people in the cafeteria, but that includes interns. Right, so. right. So on, a, so on a given program day, we usually see about 35 or 40 brain okay. survivors. And in terms of like how many active members we have at any time, it's usually about 70. Like we'll see 70 in a month. Okay. Um, in a year, we'll see over 100. And what's the cost to them to participate? Uh, it depends on their fi- their financial situation. So we provide our services on a sliding scale for those who are um, below median area income for where they live. And so for some people, they don't pay anything to attend. I mean, you can imagine if, you know, if you've had a brain injury and you're not able to go to work, you're probably not going to be in too good shape financially. Right. So half the people that come to Crumble Center don't pay anything. Some people are like, you know, a a couple, one is still working, so they might have a little income or someone worked and built up, you know, some finance, they were pretty good shape. And so they're maybe paying a few dollars, you know, here, there, $15, $20 a day. Um, some people come to our program that have funding through the, through the state, basically. And though that doesn't pay for the full cost of their attendance, it pays for a portion of it, for the rate that we're getting. But our daily rate is 65 a day. Okay. And I would say probably 15% of the people that come can pay Pay that full daily rate. Right. Does that match the 
cost of running the organization? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I think That's it's probably about, through, so. yeah, maybe yeah. maybe 15% of our operating costs okay. are covered. Maybe 20%, something like that. So, yeah, we do a lot of fundraising. Yeah. So let's transition to kind of talk about your role then as, okay. as the executive director. Uh, I assume fundraising is an important part of what you do or, or you oversee. Uh, yeah, oversee. oversee. I guess. So I would... you, have a, you have a fundraising person. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. so I have so I have my program team, and then I have um, what we call development. Okay. My development team. I have a development director, and then she has two two employees, not full time equivalent. I think it's basically, mm-hmm. my development department is like two full time equivalents. Okay. And so she, I do have an important role of fundraising in the sense of. If she tells me I need to be calling someone or <laughs> thanking see. someone, yeah. but just really relating, you know, having a really good relationship with our donors and also with our um, event partners, because we have a couple of big events that we're either putting on ourselves or the beneficiary of, and making sure we have good relationships to keep those going and going well. And we do a lot, we do quite a bit of individual fundraising. And so we have important relationships with donors that we need to maintain. Yeah. So I would say my role tends to be more of re- those relationships and and being a part of stewarding mm-hmm. those relationships. And I would say my role is also around helping with cultivation too, cultivating new relationships. For and donors. And for donors and other, yeah. you know, corporate, corporate sure. sponsors or what have you, for whatever those relationships are uh-huh. with the, you know, fundraising in mind with, you know, getting funding for the organization in mind. Um, but really it does fall on our development director to oversee our fundraising program. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do some public speaking as well. Like you came to a fireside chat and I spoke at that. And so that's part of my job too, is to help educate people about the organization and, you know, bring in new friends yeah. to the organization. So, so in terms of, of your annual operating budget, roughly what, com- what percent comes from fees and what percent comes from donations and and, uh, and from yeah, so we get you know it's like twenty percent fees, I would say, and then another you know ten fifteen percent, I would say, falls in like grants or other other um, kinds of fundraising, and then the remainder is you know events and individual gifts. So I have a six six hundred thousand dollar budget, and we basically about half a million of it is is fundraising. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of fundraising. That's a lot of fundraising. <laughs> and you said you do some big events. Yeah. What, what do you do for fundraising events? So we have two. Um, so outside of like our, our our donor events, we have two special events. One is the King Challenge um, event, which is a cycling fundraiser, which is on October 19th this year. Super fun. I will be riding. It's basically uh, three different cycling routes on the seacoast um, and every person who's riding is fundraising a, a minimum of $150 and it's really fun. It's a very festive event and we do that with a partner. So we've worked with a partner for, since we started that event in 2011 and there is a sort of a celebrity involved. I say he's a celebrity. I think maybe on the a small letter C celebrity Teddy King, who used to be a pro cyclist and rode in the Tour de France twice, and his dad mm-hmm. attends Crumple Center. Okay. And so he has a lot of friends in the cycling world and in the region because, you know, for those in cycling, they know who he is. And so he helps us to have, have that event be successful, and he tells his family story, which is really generous of him. So that's a pretty cool, fun fundraising event. Um, and what's really cool about it is that um, our members who want to ride, we have an adaptive course right there as well. And so with Northeast Passage, we put put our members who want to ride on the on the road as well to to participate. So that makes it pretty great. And then actually, some of our members can do the longer routes. So a couple um, guys I've I've ridden with on the route, and that's. Probably the one of the most rewarding experiences, just you know, seeing them doing their thing and knowing they struggle with other you know aspects of living with a brain injury, but they're out there on their bikes being athletic, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Great. So then the other uh, special event is the Runners Alley, formerly Red Hook, now Cisco Brewers Runners Alley Cisco Brewers 5K, 
And that's actually quite an old 5K. In its heyday, it had over 2,000 runners participating. It's got a kids' fun run, which is really fun too. That's over Memorial Weekend. We've been the beneficiary for almost its whole run. And I think it's been going for maybe 22 years now. Um, I think last year we had about 1,500 runners. So still a pretty good wow. turnout for that. And that's a, a great fundraiser for us. So also a good way to raise awareness about our organization and about brain injury. So great. those are great events for us. So, so in addition to, so, so kind of thinking about your role, uh, uh, I jumped into that with kind of a, the fundraising piece. I'm a, yeah. finance, I'm a finance guy, so I want to know ah, where yeah. it comes from. Uh, so what are the other kind of moving parts? So you have the, you have, we've talked about the programming yep. piece. Yep. What else do you uh, oversee? So, you know, because we're a small organization, we have like 10 employees. Um, I'm the HR director. And I'm the finance director, All right? <laughs> right? Uh, probably the IT director, even though it's not my forte, but, you know, you use a lot of IT we're dealing with here. So um, unfortunately, fortunately, I have some great staff that are um, helping me out with, with some of those things and more of the details. I'm working with the board is a huge part of my job. Working with the board, working with the committees, um, moving our strategic plan forward. We're just about to go into another strategic planning process because we're in our third year of our plan. So we need to be kicking that off now. So I think the whole gamut of ensuring we're meeting our mission and we are healthy and functioning as a corporation and that we are working towards strategic, you know, have our strategic hat on when we're thinking about the future and what opportunities are there and what are going to be the challenges and continuing to improve and grow over time. So we talked a little bit about the function of a board when we were talking about Fairtide. Fairtide was a very young organization. Yeah, yeah. This is a more mature organization. Right. Um, so what is the function of the board? Well, it's interesting because, you know, having been with the organization a decade now, it's really evolved since when I started. In many ways, it was very young very young organization, like maybe adolescent when I first started. Um, the, you know, our founder, Dave Kremples, uh, is still very involved and was then, but his role has shifted tremendously in my 10 years. But when I first started, you know, the board was fairly picked by him. He wasn't on the board anymore, but, you know, they were friends of his, that kind of thing, you know. So in some ways, the, while the organization's program was, more mature, more mature in some ways than the organization was, you know, in terms of its infrastructure and its board and that kind of thing. So to be a part of helping that board grow and mature has been really phenomenal. And, uh, you know, just had a governance committee meeting this morning and, and, you know, our work is really focused on, okay, what, what do we need to do to help the board be more educated about governance and fundraising? And we're working a lot on nominations for the board. And and that's just what we're supposed to be doing. It's like, you know, the right work, the good work. And I guess it feels great to work so collaboratively with the board, to have a great bunch of people on the board of directors, strong committees, um, doing good work to help strengthen the organization as we move into the future and start getting excited about strategic planning as well. And, you know, where we're going to go in the next, you know, three or four years is also exciting. So the board is not involved in the day-to-day -day management of the organization? No, right? not, not at all. And, and it really wasn't, when, when I first started, it really wasn't either, but there was a little more, I would say, closeness between the board and the staff. It just was young in that way. But over time, it's really shifted that the board is focusing on their work and the staff is focusing on their work. While we do, at the same time, we do have some board members. We have a couple, actually, that are that do volunteer for the program. Mm -hmm. One literally does make jam with that, with our members during enrichment, enrichment. Another one runs a current events group. That's a great thing that people, for some people on the board, their passion is going to be giving to the program that way, in addition to the other work that they're doing. Well, others are going to be get excited looking at, you know, financial spreadsheets or who can we bring into our next fundraising event. So 
to have that nice diversity on the board of, you know, where people's interests are in supporting the organization is pretty, pretty fantastic. So the board is interested in fundraising, your strategic planning. Governance. Yeah, they've got their heads in the right place and yeah, and making sure that, you know, we're financially strong, which is always the nonprofit world is always, you know, uh, well, I think probably any executive director has knots in their stomach every year. Like, how are we doing? Are we going to pull it off? You know, <laughs> kind of thing, even though we we know we've got a strong organization, it's still stressful to get that work done and, and do it well and invest in good ways. So it's another thing the board really has to pay attention to is if we're going to make investments, those are big decisions to make. How are we investing? What are we investing in? Is this going to help us build our capacity, for example? When you say investments, what do you mean? Do you mean meaning, financial investments or you mean you mean physical infrastructure? Uh, uh, meaning, as any healthy, mature organization should, we have some funds that um, are what we call our reserve funds for special purposes. And yes, in that sense, they are invested and someone's paying attention to that, how that's doing, or our finance committee. Um, but also, but more of what I was thinking about was we've got our annual operations, and these are the things we do every year. This is what the costs are associated with it. But then sometimes there's going to be special things that we really need to, they're not an annual operating expense, but they're an expense that is coming up and is more like a one-time. So, for example... Last year, we invested in a new database for our program. So we, we spent quite a bit of, from my perspective, yeah. it's small scale, really. I know that. Right. But nearly $20,000 on yeah. a new database. You have a $500,000 budget, $20,000 is a lot. <laughs> exactly. Budget, so that's yeah. a big investment. Yeah. But yet, I love that we made that because I feel like it would have been foolish and this happens in the nonprofit world all the time. Be like, no, we really can't afford that. But then you get stuck not, not having what you need to do the good work that you're doing or thinking about down the road that this is, this, this investment is going to pay out long term because we're going to get the information we need from it. It's going to be more efficient for our staff, et cetera. So, and then this year, um, we're investing in strategic planning. So we're spending, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on that. And that's important. And I'm glad that my board gets it and and understands that, yeah, it's not ideal to be, you know, spending some of that money, but it's also really important for the organization to be spending spending that money. So mm-hmm. I'm pleased that we can do that when we need to be doing that. Otherwise I'm gonna be spending a whole lot of time looking for grants to cover that. Yeah. And then and that is an option. So yeah. the board can say, you know what, actually I why don't you look for those funds this year? Why don't you try to find those dollars or find someone who's gonna support it? And that's okay too. We're not we weren't needing to do that, but it's that's certainly a reasonable thing to do. So you mentioned knots in the stomach. So yeah. uh what uh, about finances? <laughs> As the executive director, what keeps you up at night when you're thinking about the organization? I would say certainly finances at times yeah. are pretty stressful. Yeah. Something's not going. I mean, really, the expenses end, typically nothing goes too nuts on that end. It's usually more about variances on the income end. And fortunately, what tends to happen is you're coming up short here on the right but you're making up for it here on the left. That's it, it happens pretty much every year that way. And th- the more dramatic, though, the more stressful it is. So we maybe are coming up shy on one of our special events, 10000 Well, if we get a couple $5,000 donors on the other end, we're breaking even on it, and that's good. So making sure that we're figuring, we're anticipating that, seeing, you know, what's happening with whatever it is. Or maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's like we lost a $10,000 donor for some reason, whatever, they're moving their funds somewhere else or what have you, or they can't do it this year or whatever. Well, we've got to make up for it. Maybe we can make up for it with a, you know, on a special event center or a grant or what have you. So those, yes, those are, you know, and I am glad that I'm not alone in worrying about it, though I hate the fact that my development director and I are usually the ones that are worrying about that together. Uh-huh. But she's also probably glad to not be alone in it. Yeah. 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 
So okay. that's the kind of thing that worries yeah. me. I would suppose otherwise, you know, I do think, you know, other things, are there opportunities that I, I need to know about that could expand what we're doing or what have you, understanding funding, worrying, I, I think this isn't really based on anything realistic, but just worrying, am I missing something, you know, that's going to be good for the organization, you know, I'm missing out on an opportunity that, that, that could be of help to us. Um, cause I'm not talking to the right person or what have you. But again, that's not really specific to anything. It's just more like I want to do good by the organization. It's as yeah. simple as that. You know, you came on board in 2009. And yeah. That so it was a bad time financially, right? So true. we're in the middle of uh, yeah. deep in the financial crisis. Yeah. Very um, true. How did that affect Kremples and affect your efforts? And how is that? changed over time. That's really interesting. I don't think I really, because we were in it, I don't think I really put it together, but that was, it was a particularly stressful time around that 2010 time. 2009, I was just getting my feet wet, right? And just getting, mm -hmm. but then because that was actually about the time we made a decision to invest in a development director. We hadn't had one until then. We were kind of scraping by and working to make it work. And we made a big decision, which in retrospect was um, a little bit risky, right? Because we're like saying, okay, we know it's going to cost us a bit of money to upfront to pay for this position, but we think we've got some low hanging fruit and that it will pay off. And it did. So um, I would say we were able to ride that out. And I think part of why we were really stressing was because things were looking pretty crappy out there. Yeah. I mean, I imagine a lot of people who had discretionary money to give probably suddenly didn't or had a lot yeah, less. Yeah, it was, yep, yep, right? true. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So you've spent most of your career in nonprofits, a little stint right. in government. What do you think the most challenging thing is about working in the nonprofit sector? I would, yeah, I guess it would, it would have to be just the, the fundraising stress, I would say. Mm. And I think probably, in our case, uh, in our case, we're primarily not gathering federal or state dollars. We're getting some indirect, indirect dollars that's coming through another nonprofit that's coming from the state slash federal government. I do think that if we were more reliant directly on those dollars, that would be really stressful because New Hampshire is not generous with their government funding. And, you know, it's just less and less. And so um, organizations have to work harder and harder to do the work that they're doing, which is really unfortunate because it's all so essential to having a happy, healthy community or as healthy as you can be. So that's too bad. But yeah, I would say that's the most challenging is just the, just the fundraising. I find th though that it's, while it's stressful and challenging to fundraise, it's also quite inspiring to and humbling to work w to be able to work with such generous people in the community, like whether it's you know individuals or companies that are providing you know what sponsorship dollars or food for an event or what have you. There's just a lot of generous people out there. And that really is quite moving and I think balances out very much the stress of, of the fundraising piece. What do you see the future of uh, Krempels looking like? So you're working on your strategic mm. planning. Uh, I mean, if I could wave a magic wand, I would so have like Krempel Center-like programs and others of state. I would take it as far as it possibly could, because I do think it's a model that works. It's a model that's really impactful. Um, I love the university partnerships we have, and I think that's really building professionals in that way. So there's that other benefit outside of the really important work that we're doing with brain injury survivors. So that's my magic wand, and I would love to see us do a couple of new things. And again, it's all funding, really funding based, but to do more around vocational programming, overt vocational programming. For the members. For the members. For yep. Just to be able to provide more support because vocational rehabilitation, great. They do great work. 
they don't, they, it's hard to work with brain injury survivors, I think, versus someone with like a physical disability to figure because there's so much invisible there. And so that's not an area that that's very strong for them. And so it's often a hard transition for our members to go back to employment. And that's true for brain injury survivors everywhere. I mean, it's a huge issue. It's a huge problem. I'd love to be able to do some partnering there. And also, I think what we're seeing emerging is uh, in, in the brain injury world is a lot more people coming to us who are struggling with post-concussive syndrome. And are that? so they are months or six months plus out away from a concussion or a series of concussions, multiple concussions, and they're still struggling with the after effects is still impacting them day to day and really could use some support. And so we think we have a great idea around providing that kind of support. The model that we have isn't quite the right fit for them, but we have some sense of what would be. But again, if we can, if we could get some dollars to go with that, we think we've got a lot of expertise to make that happen. So I could see so I think Magic Wand, I would do all of those things and really expand more what we're doing. A couple questions on leadership and then we'll, we'll mm. cut it off. Okay. So Sounds what good. would you say your leadership philosophy is? Oh, philosophy. Mm. Um, my leadership philosophy, I think it's just, honestly, it's being a good listener, supporting people, building their leadership skills. I think just being a, a kind person around my colleagues and giving them lots of gratitude for the work that they do. And having been on the other side where I've worked for a leader or leaders in the past and just knowing that, you know, people really are paying attention to what you're doing. And so I'm try I try to be attentive to that and recognize the power that I have and recognize my role and just trying to be a good steward of the organization and model, I guess, being a good leader and being a good human being. You talked a couple of times about organizational culture when you're talking about kind mm. of your, your journey yeah. here and some good cultures, some not so good cultures. What aspects of organizational culture are particularly important to you? And how do you try to shape that within, mm -hmm. within this organization? I mean, I think part of why I love being here is that is this is an incredibly positive culture. And I feel a little bit like it's a little utopian in that sense. And it really, you know, fits with my social worky heart. <laughs> For sure. I have no tolerance for speaking poorly of friends of the organization. Of, I expect people to be diplomatic in their communications. I expect people to show how to talk about people. And sure, we deal with frustrations and people aren't always meeting our expectations, but I do expect people to speak diplomatically of anyone associated with the organization. And I think people, and I think that comes naturally to people working here, and then I think that sort of filters down then. I mean, it filters up because that's how our culture is, our, our member culture is, is just like, yeah, you have a tough time communicating, we're going to wait for you. Or you need a hand with that, I've got your back. You want me to just be here while you sort of struggle through and do it yourself? Yeah, all right, I'm with you kind of thing. That's how our members relate to each other. And so I think that trickles up and then we trickle down in terms of just I, I don't want to say it's like, I heard, um, you know, it's called the Disney effect where people don't need to know what's going on behind the building. Mm. They just need to like go in there, have fun and experience the, the show or whatever at Disney. And that's what I ask of our staff to do as well. And they do a fantastic job with so that our members don't have to be thinking about anything but themselves and their experience here and getting what they need out of the organization. You talked about Barbara. Barbara uh, Frankel. Barbara yeah. Frankel as a mentor. Yeah. Um, what does a good mentor do? Um, I think a good mentor is inspiring, and a good mentor is a 
teaches you something or some things. And so from Barbara, I really learned about being a good writer and like editing and editing and, you know, cause she was always editing my grants, you know, with a red pen and, or maybe I'm just imagining it was a red pen. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a different kind of mentor for me in a way, but she, I think she was like, she was kind of awe inspiring cause I just watching her be the kind of leader that she was being. Her tenacity was ad- admirable. I've had other mentors and, you know, another one comes to mind is Mike Scarponi and he was my boss over at Rocking and Community Action. And man, I took that job because of him because he, I could hear his laughter when I walked in the building and I just was loving that kind of energy, just the like positive and, you know, he's a supportive guy and he's, you know, continues to be a friend of mine and is happy to just give of his knowledge and experience and guidance. And I really appreciate it. So for a young person thinking about a career in health, Mm. why social work or working with uh, brain injury? Well, how would you sell kind of your, your career? Yeah. I think, you know, I think everyone has to find their own path And I think it really is kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of trying things out. Is it a fit? What is it specifically that's really working for you? Or what is it specifically that's really not? And then keep on doing that until you find what's right. I was never one of those people that I had like, okay, this is my vision. I'm going to do this. And this is, you know, the the path I'm going to pursue was always like, okay, what's next? Okay, what's next? So here I am at Crumble Center 10 years later, and I, I didn't have a vision for something different. It was like, okay, this is the right fit for right now, and yet I'm still here, and that's because I love it. I love everything about it, from the work culture, to the people work, of the professionalism, the creativity, the innovation, the meaningful impact we're having that I see every day. And so I want to keep doing that. So I think it's about finding what you love and keeping on doing it. And if it's not what you love, figure out what that is. And be okay with flailing around for a while like I clearly did as we went through my years of (laughs) hopping around. But I'd have zero regrets, you know, from that. Whether it was internships, jobs, my semester not in school and trying something out, hopping around with my figuring out what, I was going to get a degree in. It's all good in my mind. It's all good experience. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, kind of in closing, for people who might want to follow Kremples, maybe find out more, uh, where can they find uh, you guys and yeah. online and you know, social yeah. media or whatever? And we love interns of all kinds. So okay. if someone's listening and you think it might be a good place for you to be, we'd be glad to talk to you about it, even if you're not in one of those particular disciplines that, that I mentioned. Um, so crumplecenter.org is our website. Um, and you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has yeah. been great. Thanks a ton, Mark. It's been awesome. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast, look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.